<laughs> no. Okay, before you start, let me just get my oh, yeah. paper. Hi, everybody. Hello. Happy Thursday evening. <laughs> Glad you all could come tonight. Uh, my name is Ashley Warthen. I'm the arts coordinator here at Richland Library. And tonight's program is a part of a series of programs presented in conjunction with the Americans in the Holocaust exhibit brought to us by the American Library Association and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. We hope that you've had a chance to peruse the exhibit before you came in. If you haven't, it will be here through August 18th. So don't worry, you have a little bit of time left. It's bittersweet that this is our final larger event um, associated with this powerful exhibit. Over the last six weeks, we've welcomed such a range of authors, historians, panel talks, film series, guided tours, children's and teen programming, and compelling community conversations, all surrounding the themes of this exhibition, which examines the motives, pressures, and fears that shaped Americans' responses to Nazism, war, and genocide from 1933 to 1945. As we come to a close with this last presentation, we want to send a very special thanks to our partners at the South Carolina Council on the Holocaust, who have been instrumental in bringing this exhibit to Columbia, not to mention helping us plan, coordinate, and organize all of its pieces and parts, and who have sponsored many of these amazing programs, such as this one. Extra thanks in particular to the Council's Executive Director, Scott Alspemeyer, and the Board Chair, Lily Filler, who's unable to be here tonight, unfortunately, um, who have both been amazing help uh, through these years-long process um, that we started in 2019. <laughs> thanks, COVID. We are so happy to have author and professor Ted Rosengarten with us this evening. 
Ted is the Emeritus Professor of Holocaust Studies at the College of Charleston and an Associate Scholar of Jewish Studies at the University of South Carolina. Winner of the National Book Award and a MacArthur Fellowship, Ted is currently researching Nazi plans for a post-war Europe and writing about the unfulfilled promises of America's era of Reconstruction. Here to present his talk entitled An American at Studhoff, First Nazi Camp on Polish Soil, I present Ted Rosengarten. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashley. And thank everyone for coming out on a Thursday evening at six o'clock in summer heat to hear a talk about the Holocaust and probably about a place most people have never heard of. Um, but I'll, and most people who suffered there during the Holocaust had never heard of it either before they got there. But it was in August, of August 31st, 1939, the day before World War II began, when Nazi police in the city of Danzig, this is the free city of Danzig, we're looking at uh, uh, in the slide, arrested 1,500. Two days later, when the Nazis were now occupying the eastern part of Poland and the western part of half, excuse me, of Poland, deposited the men in a small clearing in a forest that came down to the sea. These, uh, the newspaper, the uh, Danzig Vorposten or Outpost, said, we have arrested traitors, arson, Of course, they had arrested, rather, the cultural elite, the Polish cultural elite of a city that was made up of Poles and uh, Germans. And that had been Danzig, the city of Danzig, a so-called free city, a city that was uh, in, on Polish soil, but since uh, the end of World War II uh, had been administered by the League of Nations as an uh, open city. Uh, when the Nazis came to power in 1933, they had their eye on Danzig, and uh, uh, the eye was uh, to uh, make it a, uh, a thoroughly German city. In fact, of all cities with a majority German population in and out of Germany, it was probably the most German, certainly the least Jewish, uh, but a combination of uh, German and uh, uh, Polish. Um, the... Uh, were, Nazis were purging the Polish and Jewish minorities from the old port city. And on September 17th, the first truckloads of Jews arrested as Jews were brought to the site and put to work building barracks and expanding the clearing for what would become Stutthof, uh, the, first, uh, the first concentration camp built outside of German soil. Uh, uh, during uh, the war. Eventually, 120,000 people would be registered at Sutov. Some 65,000 would die, a huge mortality rate. Actually, the, the camp held more than that because some 20 to 30,000 people who were executed upon arrival uh, were not uh, uh, even registered. Uh, we know very little about this place. We know why, and the question is, why should we care? Why, what does this, what is knowing about Stutthof, what does it tell us about the Holocaust that we can't find uh, anywhere else, uh, that we can't learn at Auschwitz, or we can't learn at camp at Mauthausen or Buchenwald, camps that were uh, thoroughly concentration camps? I hope at the end of my talk you feel, uh, you know, we have an answer to it. I've made really two trips to uh, Stutthof. The first was a physical trip in which I traveled uh, to the uh, Baltic coast, with a, uh, a dear Polish friend of mine, Jerzy Pitko. Well, we traveled there uh, uh, a year ago in, in, um, in, in April, and we had uh, different reasons uh, for going. Jerzy and I are, are very old friends. He's been a guide on uh, studies abroad that my wife, Dale, and I have been leading now for almost uh, 20 years. And uh, Jerzy and I have traveled together just as friends, We've been hiking in Ukraine. Um, we've traveled, uh, three years ago, we traveled uh, to the uh, eastern part of the country to a death, to the ruins of a death camp called Sobibor. And it was the first trip that either of us had made there. And now we were coming to Stutov. And we were going up to Stutov. I was going because I knew, the one thing I knew about Stutov before I went is that it was the only camp in Europe 
that was exterminating Jews from day one of the war. And again, it was the first camp built and the very last camp uh, in Europe to be um, liberated. But Yezhi was going, he had other reasons for um, uh, uh, making the trip. I said that at the beginning, some 1,500 Poles were arrested. Uh, that included 650 Polish clerics, po Polish Catholic priests, who were arrested from uh, Danzig and the whole Danzig area. 450 of those men were executed. Uh, and the site has become a kind of a site of pilgrimage for Polish Catholics who come um, to visit uh, Stutthof and the shrines that have been set up to it. So Jerzy was going, Jerzy was coming to see the, uh, uh, the place where the uh, Catholics, uh, he is Catholic, where the Catholics were put to death. And I was coming to see this place that uh, was not very well known uh, to the uh, historians and to the history of the Holocaust, but was a major um, a center uh, of extermination, became one, a major center of extermination. Um, actually, the camp itself uh, went through four phases. At first, it was, it was set up as uh, uh, intentionally to eliminate every trace of political opposition to Nazi rule in that part of uh, Poland and uh, in that part of Germany as well, specifically in Danzig. And the opposition included uh, trade unionists, um, uh, journalists, uh, uh, even kind of the leaders of uh, the Boy Scouts. And uh, they were removed by arrest, kidnapping, segregating, isolating, humiliating, and eventually kind of exterminating. So in, at the first part, it was really sort of a local camp to uh, get rid of the local opposition to the Nazis. And that's from 1939 until about 1941. In 1941, uh, leading uh, Nazi designer of the Holocaust, Heinrich Himmler, um, paid a visit to uh, Stutthof and uh, declared that now this camp will have to change its function or have to enlarge its function and would become a camp of slave labor as well. In other words, it would hold the uh, arrests, numbers of arrests and people sent here would be increased. And uh, it was necessary. Now, in fact, the uh, Nazi head of armaments, Albert Speer, uh, had told Himmler that the production of military needs could no longer be confined to the actually the borders of the camps itself. And so it would be necessary to set up various kinds of uh, sub camps. Let me see if I can find on my. Uh... So here, by the way, is a photo of Gdansk today. Danzig is Gdansk. Gdansk was Danzig. Gdansk is the Polish name for the city that was once Danzig. Very beautiful city. Uh, um, uh, Dale pointed out that it looked very Dutch to her in colors. Uh, uh, there's a reason for that. Because after Danzig went four years, or actually through five years, through 1944, uh, without noticing the war. It was still a, uh, um, a resort town for Germans who came to it. Uh, there was very, very, and it was known, uh, it was in peace. In 1945, the Allies bombed and obliterated Danzig. And in rebuilding it after the war, the Poles decided they didn't want to rebuild in the style of German architecture. And so they went, they looked, and they brought Dutch and Belgian architects uh, into Danzig to rebuild as, um, in fact, as uh, now as uh, Gdansk. See where this takes us. And this is uh, a landscape. If you visit uh, a Sturthof camp today, what remains is this landscape of a, of, of a camp. If we look very, very closely, um, uh, two buildings which I, I want to point out in just a moment. One here and one here. This one, I think you can already guess its function. Yes. Papers. Okay. And so Danzig went from being a local camp to a slave labor camp and building at, and at the same time, um, and here, by the way, if, if you were to visit Danzig in 1945 at the end of the war, these are barracks you would have seen. However, shortly after this photograph was taken, the, the people, the Polish people in the neighborhood 
who were um, dirt poor and had no building materials to rebuild their own lives came in and tore these buildings apart and took the, the building materials out uh, for themselves. This is a, um, a plat map of the camp. Some very, very interesting features on it. We see uh, Camp for Jews listed uh, at, at the top, kind of a, which is a smallish camp. We see something called women's camp. Um, uh, and uh, we can study this and see kind of the layout of a relatively small camp. 1944, this is before a very, very big change, which I'll describe in just a moment. So it went from a uh, kind of a local camp to do away with local opposition to the Nazis, to a slave labor camp, which held thousands and upon thousands of people who would go outside of the camp to work in the sub camps. And then in 1944, in June of 1944, Mr. Himmler comes to visit again and announces that uh, this will now be turned into an extermination camp and a gas chamber uh, is built uh, on the premises. And we can see, see if I go back, this little small brick building in the back is a gas chamber and it's located right next to what would become the crematoria. Um, uh, and these are more kind of barracks. Oops. This crappy looking little building on the left is the entire kind of killing apparatus of the gas chamber. That was it. It was a gas chamber which killed by the use of Zyklon B, the same gas that was used at Auschwitz. And this is the crematoria right next to it. You can say, well, how many people could they possibly have killed here? The number of people who died, who were killed um, at Stutthof, um is minimum 65,000. And uh, including the people who had come in and were not registered, probably 85 a uh, thousand people. So Himmler comes in here. Um, also, if you were to have visited several years ago, you would have seen this pile of shoes. And now we find shoes at other places. If you visit Auschwitz, of course, there's a room, uh, big piles of shoes. And um, the the museum people established, who are establishing a museum here said, well, the very first thing you lost when you came to Stutt, uh, Stutthof was your shoes. You're, and so they, the shoes are now arranged in somewhat of a, uh, and you, if you see up in the uh, kind of a left-hand corner, there's a little uh, uh, caption, little insignia that said, it says Ghetto Fighters House. This is a photograph which comes from an archive kept in a Galilee in Israel at a place called the Ghetto Fighters House, which was in fact a kibbutz that was set up by um uh, survivors of the ghettos after World War II. Today is a magnificent archive, and this is one photograph from uh, their uh, collection. Now, this is what the gas chamber looks like today. And if you notice, there's a star, a six-pointed star of David, and there's a cross. And what we have here, as we have at other camps as well, of uh, various uh, groups of victims who more or less are competing for the victims the victimizer, who is, you know, who is, who was hurt most here, you know, uh, and, uh, but each has become uh, a, a, a kind of uh, a shrine, as you, as you can see. Let's see, we will get to Mr. Here is Heinrich Himmler himself, architect, chief architect, head of the Gestapo, uh, head of the SS, a chief architect of the uh, Holocaust, and he is uh, meeting with uh, the guards at Stutthof. He's come, he came to help set up the camp. He came in 1941 when he announced it would now be a slave labor camp, and he came back to announce it would be an extermination camp. One of the very interesting features of this to me is the age of the guards here. These are relatively older people. They're old, you know, these are, these are men in their 40s and 50s, uh, most likely who belong to the Volkssturm, to the to a people's militia, who were from Danzig itself, who had been uh, Nazified, who had been subjected to uh, Nazi um, uh, propaganda uh, for many, many years, uh, confirmed uh, Nazis, uh, and um, uh, Himmler was coming. And it was quite an honor to be in this group 
to, and they had no problem in, in subsequent years of recruiting uh, uh, what, uh, whatsoever. It was uh, easy to recruit um, uh, to get to this. Let me see. So we have the four distinct, uh, 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 or the three distinct stages of the camp, and then there's actually a fourth, and I think it's in some way uh, the, uh, maybe the most uh, important, uh, is that this, ca this camp uh, not only was a camp of very high mortality, it was of especially high mortality of women, of Jewish women. Um, I'll give an example. In, after the uh, gas chamber was built, um, some 50,000 Jewish people were transported to the camp. Uh, in one of the groups of transports was 26,000 um, people, Jews, who were just coming from Hungary, in which the, the Nazis had uh, uh, were removing Jewish people of Hungary, and 25,000 of the 26,000 were women and who were brought to the mortality rate of women on the, during the evacuations and the Dutch and the death marches was uh, the highest mortality rate for women and the highest absolute number of any of the camps, more than, a, more than a, during the death marches, the evacuations at Auschwitz, more than the marches at the camp uh, we call Ravensbrück. Many people have heard of Ravensbrück. It was the one uh, Nazi camp not a death camp, an extermination camp, though thousands of people died there. The one camp that was um, built for women, and it's actually so-called sister camp of uh, uh, Stutthof, and the Ravensbrück camp is in uh, north of uh, uh, Germany um, uh, it, itself. So we have this uh, large camp, and we have um, uh, Mr. Himmler uh, uh, coming, and Himmler had a, a, a a special job. He was not only there to uh, kind of raise the morality, uh, he was a, 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 the moral rep of the morale of the people, but he was a key player in the destruction of life in occupied uh, Poland. And, and his influence was especially deadly after um, uh, Stutthof met the high standard for admission into the concentration and then the death camp. Uh, system. He brought with him what I would call a blueprint for racial uh, Im imperialism. More than just a desire or a quest to uh, take out new areas of the east of Poland, uh, which we call and settled Germans there, the movement we call Lebensraum. Uh, uh, it was also a Kulturkampf. Its object was to identify specific people who either had to be German and thus racially pure and nothing else valued. So far beyond mere military victory, because the Poles, in his estimation, in Nazi estimation, were regarded as subhumans, they were to be reduced to virtual slave status, accompanied by the total destruction of um, all uh, cultural, political, and religious symbols that would provide them with any uh, form of human identity. This is another uh, plat. I should have actually had it next year, which if you'll notice that the uh, script is in Hebrew and it's on the alignment of prisoners of Jewish prisoners. And this was built, this, uh, this plat comes from a later period, comes from the period of extermination and the Jewish um, quarters are in the uh, your far left of the... Uh, of, of the piece. Let's see what the, okay. So the, it, if we imagine what it was like for people who came into the camp in uh, 1944, most of the people who came in during the extermination phase had been at other camps. They'd been at Theresienstadt, they'd been at uh, uh, Mauthausen, they'd been uh, at, at Auschwitz itself, and they arrived in, uh, in, in horrible physical shape. Usually, uh, they plotted on. They were described by their um, by their peers, by other people. They came with kind of black faces, hair growing from their skin and bristles. They plotted on, staring with their huge black eyes, with what seemed to be inhuman expression. They wore neither sweaters nor jackets, only torn summer dresses, through the tears in which their gray bodies could be seen. They were without chests, gaunt their pointed shoulders. They were more like some weird, ugly birds 
In their hands, they gripped pieces of bread, but were unable to eat. Were they aware what, that they were, where they were being taken? Of course they knew, they suspected, they resisted. The SS had to think up new tricks to mislead them. They were gassed in special railway wagons, the SS men dressing up as railway men, or in specially adapted trucks. Again, a total of some, I, I said I had made two trips to uh, start off. One was the physical trip, and the second was a deep dive into the archives. The ar and what and what we have from Stutthof today are incredible oral histories, some of which have only come public in 2015. And we have um, affidavits uh, taken by uh, a, a group called the Polish um, uh, Swedish Holocaust Committee, which was one Pole and one Swede who in 1945, as women were being rescued in the spring from the camp and brought to Sweden, uh, uh, took, took down um, uh, their stories. I want to talk briefly about uh, the, this period of um, uh, e evacuations. You know, I find my piece. Okay. Himmler, Mr. Himmler involved in everything in, uh, uh, in the fall of uh, 1944, uh, announced that all the camps would have to make plans for removing, for evacuating the prisoners, for moving them uh, into Germany proper. Uh, they m had to keep a, uh, um, a slave labor population. And one of the uh, interesting things to me about that is one of the people he, that, who was charged with, um, uh, with carrying out this program of evacuation was a Nazi named Odilo Globi Globojnik. And uh, Globojnik um, had, uh, had been actually one of the people uh, in charge of uh, setting up the infrastructure for uh, destroying the um, uh, Polish Jews. And now he was being charged. The same guy who had built this kind of career on killing Jews was charged with trying to preserve a Jewish slave labor force and to bring them um, into, uh, in, into Germany one of the uh, sort of little ironies. Well, when it was time to evacuate, um, there were some 50,000 Jews at Stutthof and its subcamps, 25,000 in each, 25,000 in the actual, uh, uh, here is a map, in fact, of only the major subcamps. If we look carefully at this map, we see Stutthof on the coast of the uh, Baltic Sea, and we see this about 30 some odd camps named here. There were actually 105 subcamps. These are camps which are, are not there permanently, but were set up for specific work. And quite a number of these, for example, here's uh, Gotenhafen, uh, just um, see on this map to the uh, west of Stutthof, which one is, one is a camp for Jewish women laborers. Um, uh, and numbers of the camps were strictly uh, for uh, Jewish uh, uh, women laborers. So there were 50,000, 25,000 were being moved, were moving from the uh, subcamps, and 25,000 to move out from Stutthof itself. And what to move toward, um, if we look also in the, uh, uh, in the west, we see Lauenburg up at the top. That was to be the march. They were to be marching from Stutthof uh, to uh, Lauenburg. Problem was, um, only 11,000 uh, from the camp itself, fewer than 12,000 people were able to walk. They were able to almost half the camp's population. Uh, uh, and they were feeble anyway, given very meager rations to take on this uh, trip, uh, which they ate immediately, a little bread, a little margarine. Uh, many were already infected with typhus, a lice-borne disease, which uh, spread through the camps, uh, and it was winter. Uh, so with deep snow drifts, sub-zero temperatures, then there was the unpredictability of the guards themselves, of the SS, and the presence of the German people, of the East Prussians, because we had the guard, the Germans, they're getting the hell out because the Red Army is coming. The Prussians, the German people, are trying to leave because they they were fearful of of the depredations of of the Soviets uh, as well. And so you had the German, the army, the, uh, uh, the 
uh, civilians themselves, and now you had the Jewish prisoners and non-Jewish prisoners all on the same roads trying um, uh, to uh, flee west. Flee west for the first three days of their walk, um, uh, their march. There were no added provisions, uh, and f uh, contact with local people was uh, forbidden. However, what we do know is what the march does. What this march does is it sets up a new sorts of relationships of prisoners with the German people themselves. Something that no one can say. Well, we didn't know. We didn't see. You know, in the areas they walk through, and that's true not only for the march of the prisoners from Stutthof uh, to Lauenburg. By the way, they never reached Lauenburg for, on that march, but it's true for the great marches out of Auschwitz. Uh, out of Flossenburg, out of Malthausen, those marches as well. Suddenly, people are marching uh, in the areas where, in fact, uh, German people um, live. Um, one of the survivors, one of the male survivors, Martin Nielsen, <coughs> wrote in his memoir about uh, stopping for the night in barns and stables or in churches in different villages. The people were locked up. Um, and they were fighting for straw to lie on on the dirt floor. And every morning, um, uh, they, they would find their dead comrades from the previous marches lying along the sides of the road. The sight was always the same, he wrote. The striped jacket, the striped pants, the thin naked palms, and the bullet in the neck, sometimes so high that the top of the skull was torn away. Again, no one ever reached Lauenburg. Lauenburg, in fact, uh, and uh, one of the uh, problems with Lauenburg uh, discloses what a breakdown in Nazi command there was. For Lauenburg was being set aside as an evacuation camp for the prisoners of Stutthof. It was also being um, uh, set aside as a um, hospital area for wounded German soldiers. And it couldn't, of course, take both. And so uh, uh, Odilo um, Globachnik, he, he complained, he said, what am I to do with these people? Nobody will take them, nobody will feed them. And the answer everywhere was the same. Shoot your prisoners. We have thousands of our own refugees to save. So here he was, here was a man again who had spent his uh, Nazi career putting Jews to death, now trying to save this group of people who were regarded as crucial uh, slave labor, you know, uh, in an impossible a situation. By this time, the 12,000 or so inmates who had left uh, uh, Stutthof were down to 7,000. Of the missing 5,000, about half had managed to escape, and uh, the other uh, half had uh, died. As always, we're talking mainly here, and we talk about the evacuees, we're talking about women and uh, Jewish women. And um, I, I've been very fortunate to uh, be kind of the recipient of the work, the kind of um, uh, archival work that's been done and uh, by uh, several amazing uh, historians. Uh, uh, Ruth uh, Schwertenfeger wrote a terrific book on uh, Theresienstadt, also wrote a major book on, or the major book on uh, Danzig. She calls a camp near Danzig on Stutthof, and also a woman named uh, uh, Agnieszka Klis, and Klis has written particularly about women and about uh, pregnancy uh, uh, at our Stutthof. Um, and she describes the, uh, from the oral histories she has assembled, um, the women leaving Stutthof left in two marching columns. In one of them, there were Polish, Russian, Danish, German, French, and Jewish women. They were put first on a narrow gauge train and then ferried across the Vistula River. From there, they continued on foot, passing through Polish villages where they stopped for the night. They were tormented by the bitter cold and lack of food and brutally harassed by the SS escorting them and getting them to move faster, faster. At a place called Nistepovo in Polish, one of the women started to get birth pangs. She was in dreadful pain and she died. The second group, Column 9, consisted mainly of Polish and Jewish women. They marched along a similar route to the one taken by Column 7. The group's destination was the Bergschaff evacuation camp. There were pregnant women in this column, too. 
two Jewish women gave birth in the parish church at a place called Luzino. The guard escorting them allowed local women to take the babies. One of the babies, a little boy, was baptized, Jan, by the woman who took him in, but he lived only for a fortnight. The fate of the other child is unknown. The mothers of those two babies died as well. So we had this amazing thing happening along this coast, along here. At the very same time, we had women who were being driven in an evacuation from one place to another to preserve their labor power. We had women who were being exterminated, particularly from the sub camps, because the SS who were leading them had no food, had no way, and were clashing with local Germans for them. We had women uh, who were being rescued, rescued by right across from Sturtop is Sweden, rescued by the Swedish, um, uh, by the Swedish Red Cross, which had a, made a deal with members of the SS to rescue women and take them out, rescued as well by Finns and Norwegians. And we had women who were uh, flat out liberated and freed in the countryside. So freed, driven, exterminated, rescued, all going on at the same time in this, uh, in this um, area of the, uh, uh, the, the Baltic coast. Um, uh, really quite amazing. The, the evacuation and death march from Stutov of 50,000 prisoners, the overwhelming majority of them Jews, the overwhelming majority of these Jews as women. We know uh, the sea, the count where the sea becomes an actor as well. The sea become as the Germans attempt to uh, evacuate women by, sh by boat. Other Germans, other SS are driving the women into the sea and shooting them. And there are some absolute amazing descriptions in the histories of women who uh, come to the sea and in areas come up to these lagoons, these, these pools, and are driven out onto the ice and machine gunned onto the ice. Some 5,000 women. Uh, it's, if, if anyone is familiar with the, um, the news dispatches and the fiction of an Italian writer named Curzio Malaparte, wrote an amazing book called Come and See. He describes the shooting of horses and the killing of horses on the ice. This was the first descriptions I've ever read of the shooting, the shooting of prisoners, in particular women, uh, on the ice in, um, uh, in, in, in the Baltic. Um, here's a of a photograph of an American GI uh, with the corpses, or looking over the corpses of people who've been murdered on the uh, evacuation path. And uh, because he's an American, we know he's in Germany and not in Poland. This is where this is taken. Uh, and this is taken like two or three days following the murder of these people. They're not people who died who died on the march. They were rather people who couldn't continue on the marches uh, and were shot. And here we have a scene in which we don't, we don't, we can see kind of the GIs in the background who have uh, requisitioned German citizens, citizens of the local towns who are now being forced to bury, in fact, to bury the people um, who were uh, um, uh, killed on the, on the march. Now, uh, the actual, it's, it's May the 10th when the final Nazi commandant, uh, Paul Ehrlich, uh, turns over the camp uh, to the Russians who are right there. Uh, but the story, of course, Rudolf doesn't end there uh, because there are trials and, and there are two sets. Actually, there were seven trials, seven trials of the guards, men and women, who served the SS and other guards who served at Stutthof. The last trial was 2022. We're talking two years ago, when a 97-year-old woman who had been the stenographer for the last commandant of the camp was tried for being an accessory to the murder of 10,000 people and found guilty and given a two-year suspended sentence. At, which was the sentence that was agreed upon by the prosecutor and 
in front of the Atria and amazing. Here are five capos. Capos were labor squad leaders uh, at Stutthof. Uh, at the first trial uh, for um, the kind of a Stutthof brass, and all five of these men were found guilty and hanged. The last, none of the commanders, none of the commandants was actually tried uh, in Poland, but the the uh, uh, ma major uh, commandant uh, named Max Pauli, who was there, who had accepted the uh, installation of the gas chamber from Heinrich Himmler, he went on to become the commandant at the Nuremberg camp, which in Hamburg, he was arrested there and hanged for his work there. So people did, these people did not get away. Here we have um, five of the women guards who are uh, also uh, being tried, and you might pick up from the uh, uh, from the picture they're not taking the the trial very seriously, um, uh, and uh, they were tried separately in the second trial. Um, here's one of them who was known um, uh, for fixing herself up, for dressing especially nicely, you know, for her day in court. And here they are um, after the trial. They were all hanged as well. So that smirk on their faces is kind of long gone. And this is a really important photograph to me. Um, just as that photograph of Heinrich Himmler next to people tells you a lot about his, who these people are and why he's there. This is a photograph again of the hangings. And I'm looking at this little boy who has sort of popped up here. There, there are tens of thousands of people at this place called Bishop Hill in Gdansk. It's in Gdansk, who are there to look at this, to, to watch the hang. It was a huge event. So what we have happening, we have this, and it's a huge event because they know these people. These people were drawn from Danzig. These people were people who were known in the community. We have a situation in, in at Stutthof where we had a very local camp that was there to purge the uh, local uh, Poles and Jews, anyone anti-Nazi, which became an international camp. When those 50,000 people, those 50,000 Jew uh, women, mainly Jewish, they came from at least 25, 26 countries, became an international camp. And at the very end, at the very, very end, it's resorting back to being a local camp. It's resorting back to its local roots. And so this camp, Stutthof, is now back as a sort of a Gdansk um, uh, 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 in, uh, in, institution. Um, I think the, the, the one, one, one point, and a very important point that I would want to uh, uh, leave, leave people what, um, is that the, the, this, the, these people, um, Stutthof camp, uh, and through the evacuations, if we look at this, here's a photograph, this is a photograph of a death march. And I was actually looking for, I do have a, a comment here, written by um, uh, a woman who lives in this house, and who tells us, that um, uh, uh, we, they saw everything. Well, take it from me. It's here. It's it's lying in here somewhere. That we, um, that we saw and and wants us to know that um, we saw, we knew, we 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 knew what what was happening here. Okay, and we want to see on this kind of final slide shows us uh, Poland in uh, if. Poland is in brown here, Poland of today. The Poland of pre-war of pre -war, um, Europe would be circled by the yellow line. So you can see how much land Poland lost as a post-war country. Lost all of that land to what would become uh, to Lithuania, to Belarus, to Ukraine, to the Soviet Union. And land that it picked up to the West, which had been uh, annexed um, uh, from uh, Germany. I think I think we'd be uh, um, it would really be good if I throw it to questions 
and really hear from you a little bit about what you'd want to know about this camp and about what we can learn really about um, uh, the Holocaust per se from uh, is the uh, behavior of people here. So I want to throw that throw it open to uh, uh, questions. And you have no choice but to ask questions. Miss Ashley knows that I'm always asking questions. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here and just for continuing the oral tradition of the story so that um, we never forget. Um, I'm very curious about the the picture that you showed of the little boy that kind of was raised. Could we go back to that? And, I, and I'm curious as to, you said it was a big event. Do you think it was like an aha awareness? How could this happen in our own town? I know I'm asking you to speculate, but with all of your research, or was it, um, how can they do this to our own locals? I wish it was that. <laughs> I think it's more of a celebration. And I'm sorry to say that it's, uh, yeah. and, and you know, as much as I see this, it's terrible. I think of lynchings, you know? And, you know, am I happy that these people paid with their lives for, their, for the killings that they did? I, it's hard even for me to answer that, except to say, I don't know what to do with them. You know, a celebration of the vic of it's. This is the victory of Poland over Germany. This is it, and these were people who, uh, no matter what their ethnic background, were working with the Germans uh, at the camp. So I think it was. An, I think it was that uh, more so. And of course, um, this is set up uh, by the um, communist Polish authorities, as as the Soviets came in, but they never left. Well, they didn't leave for 45 years. And um, and so this was, you know, it has a, a propaganda value, you know, immediately to them. But I think it has more than that. I think it's um, it, it's Poles who, who realized, who understood that they were regarded as subhumans by um, the Germans and are um, basking. And you can see the method here, the method of hanging. Uh, the, uh, the victims were made to stand on the back of these trucks, the trucks pulled away. Yeah. Ms. Rosengarten. Where the people who are being prosecuted also had defense attorneys, and are there transcripts of these trials? Did they try to mount a defense? Did they, and were the men and the women, did they, were they held to different standards? I mean, it seems, from the little bit I know, it's it's not that common that people were given such summary justice. And it, am I correct? It only happened in the Russian uh, zone where the Russians came in. Well, everyone wanted, of course, not to be captured by the Russians um, because they knew what was awaiting them one way or another. Um, and I think one of the critiques of the Nuremberg trials, Nuremberg trials, there was the one major trial. And, um, and, a, a 21 people and a mere nine people, nine received death sentences, you know, uh, which were not commuted. Uh, only two women in Nur at Nuremberg received death sentences, which were eventually um, carried out. And following the, the great Nuremberg trial, there were 12 trials set up of uh, the trials of doctors, the trials of businessmen, the trials of, var of various people, set up all run by the American uh, military. And in those trials, five people, a total of five people, kind of uh, received death sentences. One of the problems, and this goes kind of, the, you know, back, in a way back to the question, of how do we feel, wh what do we do with these people, is people who received uh, prison sentences, all were let out, you know, by 1952, 53, there were no longer Nazis, there were more still being tried and given short sentences. But people who were killers, were, who, but who had received uh, lenient sentences, five years, seven years, whatever, were let out. Um, uh, and, and in fact, um, v many, many fewer women were tried um, by the uh, American and British um, uh, occupying forces than by the Poles and the Russians. Does that partially answer your question? 
Excuse me? Yes, case records exist. We have case records, and some are translated to English and some are not. And that's, that's another question. Why don't we know more about Stuttgart? Well, because it's in Poland and because it's, it, 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 it did not gain the reputation as an international camp, you know, until very, very late, 1944, 45. And which is amazing because what that means, if we have 25,000 women, Jewish women, who are surviving in January of 1945, well, where the hell are we on earth? Because that's not true in occupied Europe anywhere, except at Stutthof. So we have the largest single aggregation of Jewish women in Europe uh, at the beginning of the evacuation period uh, at Stutthof. Another reason for looking into it more and, uh, and uh, under understanding what the, uh, the Germans were after. No, no, it was not their first. No, these were survivors, 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 and which probably helped quite a number of them survive. Those who did survive on the, uh, uh, you know, survive the evacuations. Yeah, there were already survivors. There were already, and there was, and we know this that among uh, the women, there was a much greater um, uh, uh, camaraderie, and and. Uh, uh, help for one another than than among the men. Uh, that's that's for, for sure. Georgia, um, were there efforts to destroy the camp, like there were at other camps in the evacuation process, like when they knew the Russians were coming? Were there any efforts to destroy what was there? Hide evidence? Uh, there was no effort to destroy Stutthof. Uh, the uh, there were, Nazis were made a big effort to run away themselves to leave. Uh, but not not to destroy it. and that and and always and at camp after camp, even those camps where uh, uh, there was some of the uh, the gas chambers might have been blown up. Uh, once the commandant left, the people beneath him had no reason to stay and uh, carry out those orders. So it depended on who was there, what what the leadership was, you know, to what extent they. Uh, were, uh, in a sense, Nazis to the end. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the groups, you talk about Poles and you say Germans, and then you say Jewish. Aren't there Polish Jews? I, I don't, I'm not sure I understand, okay. which I think is might be one of the problems why Jewish people were erased. Yeah. And so... Why they were regarded as, as Jews and not as uh, yeah, war, Poles who are Jews yeah. or as Jews who are Poles. Yeah, because if they lived in America, they'd be Americans. Yeah, and, yeah. Know. Well, that that's that's how they, you know, many Jews ask the same thing. You know, why, why I, I feel Polish through and through. I'm Polish. My wife is Polish. But we're Jewish, and 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 by the standards set up by the Nazis, we are identified as Jews, and not as Poles. And even even throughout Europe, one of the things that made it possible to round up Jews was that in community after community, people were registered in their communities, you know, according to their religious faith, so that I might have been uh, my on my father's side, you know, his family lived in Austria for hundreds of years. And, and, and he spoke, his family spoke German. And he always thought of himself as somebody who was rich in German culture. But that's not how he was taken. That's not how his family was thought of uh, in their homeland. So when I, when I use it, when I say Poles, Germans, Jews, the Jews could be from anywhere. The Jewish people could be from Hungary, from Greece, uh, from Romania, especially at the end of the war, this is where they were from, from France, from the Netherlands. Um, uh, and they were regarded as Jews. So that the Jews camp at Stutthof contained people of, of many nationalities, 
whereas there was another camp that was part of it just for men from Finland, men from Norway, men from you know who were not regarded uh, if they were Lutheran, if they were Catholic or whatever. But the Jews were separated out, and the, and I think the Germans. You know, I think it's still a question in Poland today. Can I be Polish and Jewish at the same time? You get very different answers from people. Um, and I think that, you know, you right, use the word problem. That's a problem. It, I think it continues to be uh, an issue uh, in country after country. Yeah. And, you, you know, in America, less so. And we grow up, it's not, not, not it's, we are more that uh, the first thing someone asks is not about your religion or how you're identified, I feel. Um, yeah. I have a comment to make about that. Um, last week at the um, um, the, sp the speech last week, yes. um, the director of the um, Anne Frank Museum talked about the difference and the way that Europe recognized Jews as a race, specifically as a race, not as Polish, not as Russian, not as German, but as a race, whereas Americans have always recognized Jewish as a religion. So we did not make that distinction. You know, here we were American. You weren't Jewish, Catholic, Polish, but there you were a race. It's how we've seen each other differently. So Jews were eradicated as a race in Europe, not as a religion. I, I would say the, the race part, though, really comes from Germany and comes from the Germans and comes from very, very early on. It wasn't new with uh, certainly uh, World War II. Um, no, and, and, and what we have, you know, this the whole idea of race and racism is a really a 19th century construct, not before then, but we see very, very sharply in Germany in the 1880s and 1890s, early 1900s, which was a goal, which was a really a golden age for, for Jews in there, but was also a period of, of growing what we would call racial identity of Jews. Sure, but I but don't, I I would say that you don't find the word race uh, attached to that, to the Russian pogroms. Yeah, they were Jews though. They were Jews. They were Jews who were culturally different, who had been essentially uh, living together, um, but not identified, not using the word uh, uh, race. Yeah, I did find one sheet I want to read to you. This is from uh, uh, Gun Let's see. We see this house in the background, okay? And this is a woman who could have lived there. Her name is Sophia Lichi, and she recollects the march, she says, did not take place in a vacuum. We local people saw the prisoners as they dragged themselves through the snow. Uh, I saw unmistakable abuse of Jews. I was on my way to Kajua to get rationed butter and milk. I saw Jews moving down the road. I heard their screams and shots being fired. It was terribly cold, January, uh, I, no snow. Uh, I stood near the house on the road. I saw the SS men in black uniforms on bicycles. They told me to get off the road um, and put my hands up. They rushed a group of Jews along the road. They didn't look like humans, barefoot, wrapped in dark blue blankets, beaten up, half frozen. Eyes and faces, not human anymore. I can still feel those faces before my eyes. As I walked down Kijua Hill, I saw on both sides of the roads people who were shot and were not yet dead. I saw bodies wrapped in blankets with bare feet. I saw the Jews driving, excuse me, the Germans driving the Jews through Kasuva. It was a noise like wild geese passing. And again, we see this, we hear this uh, thousands and thousands of times repeated uh, in January through April of 1945, in this last phase of German genocide, the evacuations, uh, at last and most understudied phase of all. Uh, but one, 
as men as many certainly from Stutthof, is more than a third of all of the Jewish people who were murdered there died in the evacuations. Um, and this was the the camp with the highest number of evacuees outside of Auschwitz. Yes. Yeah, I was going to go back to the uh, justice aspect of it. You know, once they were able to capture these ones, of course, you know, the hangings and all that, uh, I don't think I have a problem with it, quite honestly. But um, you mentioned that those who were captured, you know, they maybe put them in prison for a while, for seven years or whatever, but then they let them out. Yes. Okay, so now, I mean, my understanding, and I could be wrong, but it seems like not too many years ago, they were still looking for Nazis, like in South South America. So that kind of doesn't make any sense to me where you, you capture these ones, you imprison them, and and then you let them go. And then yet you'll go to South America to find these, these you know, Nazis and then br bring them back for justice. In fact, there's that one where they actually went and extracted them at, at great effort and brought them back. I think that the, the is Israel did that. The same people aren't doing the looking. We're doing, we're putting them on trial. And Israel, for a long, long time, for a long time, did not want to take part at all in Nazi crime. In fact, Israel in the 1950s and 60s was busy building Israel. And uh, they knew the whereabouts, for example, of, of Adolf Eichmann, the one who was, who was caught in 1961 and brought to trial. They knew his whereabouts in the 50s and did not want to go after him. So there are different people who are the Nazi hunters from those people who tried it. And then once they're caught, those few are caught, the big issue is where are they going to be tried? Who is going to try them? And what's going to, what's going to be the results of the trial? So and like, not um, trial since I think not any that um, resulted in a death penalty being handed uh, to a, uh, a former... I, I don't know when the Hague and all that was formed, but I mean, there wasn't some kind of tribunal or something that was set up that um, we need international criminal court. Yeah, something like that. Well, the international criminal court is, 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 is incredibly interesting. The founder of the international criminal court uh, was named Benjamin Perens. And he happened to be uh, a Jewish guy who had been a GI and had been uh, the first prosecutor of a group called the Einsatzgruppen, who were mobile killers of the Nazis. And he was a prosecutor of those people. He was a, this a guy, he was a Harvard graduate and had uh, become a GI, he was a GI. And um, just before the trial, he had been appointed by um, uh, the chief justice uh, to be the prosecutor. He said, but I've never, I've never even uh, tried a case in court. And the guy said, yeah, but you went to Harvard. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, he, and he, following the trial, Spent, has spent the rest of his life here putting together the international criminal courts. And, and is a, a person uh, totally against the use of the death penalty. But I said, I don't know how, how to face up to the death penalty. I hate it, but what do we do? What do we do? What, and especially what we do if we have the record that people, in fact, will be released. If, if we say, well, this person is sentenced to life in jail for 25 years and then five years, and the person is out. You know, how, what, how, what do we do about that? Anyone has an answer, right? <laughs> question on more about this. Yes, I don't have an answer. I have a question. Yeah, I'm good. You mentioned several times that there were examples, being examples of how the local German population clearly had to be aware of what was happening. Yes. Um, the, um, so Thanks. And, and yet, I, I would, you know, I read the news and anti Semitism incidents are increasing every year in Germany now. That, you know, there's more and more of it being reported. Um, I remember your sister went to Poland to a small town in Poland this, this is several years ago to see her family, her father's family's uh, home, and couldn't find anything. Talked to the Polish citizen there, and they said, 
no Jews ever lived here. And so, you know, what's going on? It's, what can we do about it? Well, what can we do about it in South Carolina? Yeah. Or what can we do about it as Americans? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know what we do about it. Uh, I do know, for example, for um, Latvia and Lithuania to come into NATO, it was required of them that in their in their schooling system that the Holocaust be taught. And that was a that was a huge discussion going back and forth because Lithuanians can tell you the same thing: all oh, no Jews ever lived here because there are no very few Jews uh, there today. We've Dale and I've been to Poland many times. Uh, that I've never heard about. You know, no Jews. I do know, have heard, and, and go. With, we go to places where people will not remember or don't want to talk about it. But not to not to literally say, you know, these people were never here. Um, th that's that's extreme. Uh, and as far as what we can do about increasing anti-Semitism in other places, you know, I think in Germany. Um, at, at any one time, 20 to 30 percent of people are, uh, will say things or we could say are anti-Semitic. I'm not sure that it's worse now than it was 10 years ago or 10 years before that. Um, there are many thousands of Jewish people who live in Germany today. In fact, the German Jewish population of Jews in Germany is about 110,000 right now, most of whom came from Russia. And when the Soviet Union uh, broke up. Germany offered immediate citizenship to Soviet Jews. They came. Um, many met about 10,000 Israelis live in uh, Germany because it's that's where their businesses are and that's they work. Um, uh, we uh, recently went to a, we went to a Shavuot uh, service, uh, synagogue service in um, uh, Berlin this year. Uh, and I, I will say it's very rough security to try to get into the synagogue, you know. So in this clean, you wonder, well, why, why is this? And, but, but, but not nearly as difficult as trying to get into a Polish synagogue. Again, the security that you have to. So clearly there, it's there for a reason. It's there because, you know, the, um, uh, the authorities, the police are concerned uh, that people who are anti-Semitic are simply not people who say things, but people who might do something, you know, and clearly that's happened in the United States um, as well. And that's a, a kind of an on a continuing uh, fear, a uh, worry, if not a fear, a worry of uh, um, Jewish people. Um, but I don't think the world is so very different in that sense. I know a lot of people talk about more anti-Semitism. It seems to me there's more reporting of anti-Semitism that we know, but whether there's actually more and whether it, you know what? What people? I will say this though: we met on on the the last uh, trip. We uh, and some friends here who were, were with us. Um, one of the things we that Dale and I have tried to do on our trips is to introduce students to um, the uh, descendants of perpetrators or a perpetrator. So you know, it's and one of the people that. Um, uh, we met with uh, this year and last was a woman named Katrin Himmler, named Ring a Bell, Heinrich Himmler's grandniece, and who is a vehement anti-Nazi, who has written several books about the family and is, uh, and I, you know, to tell you the truth, she's become a good friend. You know, it really feels odd, my my friend Katrin Himmler, uh, and we asked her if when she goes to talk, because she talks. She, she talks about the family. She talks about um, Nazism and her own growing away from this kind of family ethos, not simply a social ideology, but, you know, this was in the family. Um, uh, we asked her, what, how, how is she received in the very conservative parts of Germany, particularly in Eastern Germany? And she described going to a high school where... Um, uh, she said the principal had said to her that half of the young men in the school wished there was a Hitler youth that they could join. This today, you know, we're not talking far away. They probably don't know any Jews, don't know what Jew means, but they knew what, what the Hitler Jugend, you, you know. Uh, so we asked uh, Katrin, we say, well, 
Um, do people ever attack you for um, taking the line that you now take? And she said, oh, no, no, they, they respect the Himmler name too much. Oh. Yes. So do you, you touched on this a little bit, but it seems to me like in America, everything is blamed on the Americans. All the atrocities that have happened in our country, pretty much killing all the Indians, racism and all that. It's all the Americans. But in Germany, it's the Nazis. Do you think that Germany got a pass, so to speak? by everything getting blamed on the Nazis and not on Germany? I think it gets a pass, that's the answer. And I was at a conference. One of the things, one of the uh, really highlights for me uh, of teaching is for several years I taught a course at the College of Charleston called Nazi Medicine. And we looked at medicine in Germany from 1915 through 1965 at the changes in patient-doctor relationships, as well as the actual, uh, you know, the period of uh, the sort of the Nazi doctors in, uh, uh, there. And I went to a conference on Nazi medicine uh, in Israel. And uh, there were about 150 researchers, doctors, all of whom, this was in 2017, were all together wondering, why are we all here? What, what is it about suddenly Nazi medicine that's and what it was is we all had this desire to move the uh, biomedical vision of the Nazis from the fringe of the study of Nazism to the center, to see that this was something. That was good. And But at this conference, I also noticed that there were a number of young kind of German scholars who were uh, what I would say were kind of left of center in their political ideologies and very few scholars from uh, Hungary or Poland or whose government were not paying for their trips and they were getting smashed in the in what I would call in the papers that were being delivered you know we, we learned how how terrible for example uh, the Hungarians were uh, um, in 1944 and 45 uh, we learned that we, we heard more about uh, the killing of Polish doctors and Jewish Polish Jewish doctors and uh, and, and uh, Jewish nurses as well. 500 Jewish women doctors, you know, singled out, you know, uh, and, and killed with Polish help, you know, not simply, you know, the Nazis. So, and I felt, in listening to this, that yes, in fact, the Germans were in some way getting a pass, you know. But on the other hand, even a, a little story like this of, of Stutthof, the, the American historians, we're placeholders. The, the history of Stotthoff, the history of the Holocaust is going to have to be written by Germans. Uh, Germans writing about Germans, not Germans writing about the, quote, the Nazis, this little uh, uh, group of people over here, but writing about the society out of which this emerges. Yeah. Yes. How have you come to understand the steps by which a civilized society could become so depraved? Well, um, <laughs> you know, we try, that's something we try to do, right? We try to look back. And um, I had mentioned that I think the, the whole idea of race as applied to Jews in particular, is something that happens in the 19th century, is, is a 19th century development. In other words, it's not natural in human beings, you know, to come up with this idea. Um, what, why, I mean, I can answer that by asking more questions. Why, for example, did the, um, uh, the whole e eugenics movement, the idea that we can take people and uh, make a superior race of people by, you know, and, uh, and by, by the way, an idea, for example, that was supported by W.E.B. Du Bois, who's a believer that we could take that talented 10th of African Americans and turn and, and make a great people, make it, we can take any group of people and breed them the way we breed horses, 
what could, you know, and make. And this is very popular ideas uh, at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. But only in one country does a political party adopt that, adopt that, and make it their program, the eugenics spread. That is to favor people, some favor, and to eliminate other people. And that's the Nazi party, the National Socialists. Why did that happen there? Why didn't that happen in England or Sweden or in the United States where there was strong eugenics movements, but there wasn't the political party that was willing to make that part of their platform? I mean, I don't have the answer you know, to this, but I see what, I see the steps. I see proof that steps have you know, that people are already on, on you know, on the movement toward that. Um, you know, you're asking, this is the, this is the question that everyone has asked who has tried to write about um, uh, world politics and the Holocaust uh, since uh, World War II. Uh, so my answer is I don't have the answer. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're going to have to end on that one. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here.